This is My Blend Stories. I'm Jeff Gerlach. Erin Lukehart is an 8th grade social studies teacher at Boyne City Middle School. She's one of the organizers of the Boyne Tech Conference. It's been held in June the last two years, right after the school year ends. If you haven't been up there before, let me sell you on it real quick. There's a lot of great sessions led by teachers sharing their ed tech best practices. And Boyne is one of the best places to be during a Michigan summer. She tweets as at E Lucky Nine, that's at E Lucky and the number nine. And you can interact with her class too. That handle is at Lucart 8 BCMS. Once again, at Lucart, the number eight BCMS. In the conversation you're about to hear, we talked about the components that help to support effective, effective technology PD how to sustain learning in those PDs beyond the initial session, and applying competency-based learning at the classroom level. This is her story. Well, good morning. Hi. (laughs) (laughs) How's things up north? Good. It's been like freezing cold, 55 degrees the last few days. So really, yeah. Has it been chilly down there? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, started in the fifties and then it gets its way up into the upper sixties, lower seventies. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. No, it's just been straight up cold here. Yeah. Jamie says hi. Tell her hello. (laughs) She's, she's going to be She's going to be heading that way too. I forget where she said she was going to go. But. Oh yeah, she's going to Burt Lake this week. She said. Yes. Yeah, yes. my parents have a place there, so I like posted a picture on Facebook and hashtagged at Burt Lake, and she was like, "Hey, I'm going there." So yeah, that's awesome. Why don't you tell me a little bit about organizing a conference like Boyne's Ed Tech event that you had going on this summer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, in terms of like the actual organization or how we got started, what are you thinking overall, whatever? Um, I, I think whatever. I think that having been a part of planning our first uh, professional development event for teachers, I have a whole new appreciation with the difficulty that's involved <laughs> with it. Yeah. And I, I'm just interested in how, how you decided to uh, start doing it in the first place because uh, this summer was your second summer doing it. It was, yeah. Um, I, I guess establishing it and uh, just kind of your goal in putting the event on, how you think it went, and maybe some growth that you saw between last summer and this summer. Sure, yeah. So, well, um, initially, we were sending a lot of people downstate for McCall or for various tech conferences which were all really great. But when you live um, in Northern Michigan, you know, everything's at least two, if not three or four hours. And I think the more we sent our staff out to those, the more we realized like, wow, we're already doing a lot of great things with technology in our district. Um, So that was part of it. Part of it was kind of that realization that we were already doing those things. And so wouldn't it be cool if we could entice people to come to Boyne City and, you know, not only kind of showcase what our school is doing, but also get some experts to come in too and and share that with us. So initially it was kind of just trying to establish something in Northern Michigan where for local teachers, it wasn't a huge hassle. It wasn't a huge drive for them. Um, and uh, our community is, is a really cool town and, and so embracing of our school. And they work really, really hard with us to help us promote, you know, our, our slogan is like, come on Friday to learn and then stay and play for the weekend. So that's been kind of cool too, because Boyne City in the summer um, is usually really fantastic except for these last few days when it's been like 55 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> well, everything, everything c- comes to an end a little bit earlier up there, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it does. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like the initial why. Um, and you know, our, our goal obviously is to showcase and maybe eventually make a little money. We're really not going to that point yet um, to support, you know, some of the technology that we already use 
um, especially like app purchases or iBook purchases, things like that, that you can't necessarily use bond dollars for. You can't use bond dollars for, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's how it started. And then um, our administrators kind of pitched the idea and said, who wants to plan that? And I thought, well, that would be kind of cool, but I don't think I can do this by myself. Like, as you said, you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility. So Rebecca and I have worked together on a couple of different things in the past. So we decided, okay, well, we'll take this on. And I think uh, we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. Um, the first year was a ton of work and Google Drive has been a lifesaver for us and that we just have everything in Google Drive. So the second year that's made it a lot easier. Um, but yeah, a ton of work, a uh, ton of work to get speakers and then um, not only speakers, but to get people to show up. <laughs> we were so excited when we, two years ago at McCall, the first person signed up and we were ecstatic. We were like, okay, maybe people really do believe that we can do something good up here. So um, yeah, the first year we had about 150 people. And I think that's what we had last year too. And that seems to be kind of a nice number, not too huge um, that, you know, you're lost in the crowd, but you can connect with a lot of different people. So ultimately, you know, it, it's just really great to have local professional development where you don't have to drive a lot of hours. And I think a lot of people come up and they're like, wow, this is a really cool place. We like it here. Or you get lost on your way out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny because uh, we put out Rochelle's podcast yesterday and I had recorded that conversation the day before we went up to Boyne. And in it, we're talking about going to the, the picnic the, the night before. And, and, and Rochelle saying, you've got to come, you've got to come. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and then we're talking about the event, right? And then she's, she's talking about how she was delinquent and didn't see it and was just going to go anyway. And, <laughs> and, and, and then as I'm editing this, I'm thinking, man, Brandon and I took up, uh, rode up together and didn't necessarily get lost, but weren't able to leave until after five. And then we ended up at a pizza hut for dinner. And oh. uh, it was, a, it was an interesting <laughs> adventure. We got to our, the, what's the name of the haunted hotel we stayed at in Petoskey? Oh, the Perry Hotel, Stafford yes. Perry. Yeah. Yes. It was kind of cool. I'd never have to remember the name of that hotel because I just tell, tell you who like you live in the Petoskey area, right? Um, I, I just tell yeah. you, tell you the haunted, haunted hotel and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, right. Haunted Hemingway yeah. stayed there too. So <laughs> I didn't hear much of anything except there was like an AC unit right outside my window and I had the window open. So I heard that all night, but it helped me sleep like the white noise did. Brandon <laughs> was freaked out. He hardly slept. <laughs> I think he let the whole thing creep into his mind a little bit too much, but maybe he was in a haunted wing and I wasn't. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I got to say about the, um, about the event though, it, it was, I think 150 people um, in that range is, is a really, really good turnout, especially when you consider how many people came from like Alpena area and from uh, downstate a little bit. And then, then there was a, a lot of people that were from the Northwestern uh, Michigan area, which was, which, which was really cool. That's, that's kind of what you wanted, right. To offer something that was closer to home, but still a lot of great presenters. And, and I think just a good community of, uh, of collaboration with, with that amount of people. And I, I know for my session, the second half of it, we were just, having kind of a workshop model to it. And it was, it was really fun just getting to interact with people and have them talk about what they're trying to accomplish this year and kind of sharing some strategies back and forth. It was, it was a lot of two-way learning even in those sessions. So like, I really appreciated that, that you put that on and I, I respect the hard work that goes into it. And I hope that, you know, you can continue to do that in the future. And I, and I hope it does become, something that helps 
your district purchase things or helps the teachers in your district at least, you know, make some additional purchases that can't be funded by bond money. I think that that's a really good goal to have with that. Yeah, it's kind of that that struggle too. Like what you said, 150 people is a nice number and you get to make those relationships, which for us, it's, it's hard to create a, an ideal PD model on a one day conference, right? Because yeah, absolutely. you want to do follow up and you want to, you know, continue to talk and make sure people are implementing things. But how do you do that when it's just one day? But I think what you said about building relationships, that's key. So then, you know, if I do try to do this in my classroom, I think you did Google Classroom, right? So if I'm trying to do that and I can't figure it out, well, now I feel like I have a relationship with you. I know you, I can find you on Twitter and ask those questions. And I feel like that in and of itself kind of builds teachers comfort level, which is huge too. So. Yeah. Uh, speaking about that, like, uh, how do you think, how do you think about effective technology PD? Like, <laughs> like what makes, what makes an effective tech PD and what makes for a largely ineffective waste of time PD? Well, funny you should ask that. I just uh, completed my master's project on this. So um, I've been reading a lot of research and um, looking through a lot of things. And I think it's stuff we know. That's that's the thing that gets me on this is we know how to create effective PD. It's not sit and get. It's not a one-time thing. That doesn't work. Teachers don't adopt whatever you're trying to implement. So I think the thing about tech PD is it's really similar to any sort of effective PD in that it has to be ongoing, right? It can't be this one-time thing. There needs to be follow-up if you really want teachers to adopt and implement. Um, there, there has to be some sort of social component. Again, this is kind of according to the research that I've looked at. And um, it's really a little bit different for adult learners, too, where they seem to feel a little bit more comfort in having some face-to-face. So, you know, the blended stuff that you guys are doing is, is so relevant, not just for today's students, but for adult learners, too. We crave that personal interaction. And we, I think as adult learners, we don't always get that, you know, through um, social media or through kind of a forum online. So having that blended model, I think, is really effective. Um, But one of the big things that I I kept going back to is teacher's comfort level. So providing some sort of supports to increase teacher's comfort to make them feel like I can do this. And if it doesn't work, um, I can try something else. You know, that fear of failure is is so huge and and wanting to be the know-all in your classroom where Sometimes in my classroom, if it doesn't work, my kids will find a workaround or will kind of move on for the day and, you know, lesson learned. But um, comfort level is just so huge in actually implementing something new with technology or utilizing something different. So speaking about comfort level, and I guess that it could work a, a number of different ways as I'm thinking out loud here. Um, but I think there's there's two there's two big trains of thought as far as PD um, kind of experts or uh, you know a presenter someone who knows something decides that this is a relevant need for for teachers and kind of says okay um, this is what we're learning about today and then goes about personalizing where you know. Um, just checking where everyone's at and then kind of um, you can get to what the teacher needs by kind of zeroing in on that. But you kind of like set up the parameters to a very narrow scope to begin with. But then there's also like this open um, almost workshop model where people bring what they want um, to work on, whether it's an actual thing or whether it's just an idea of something that they want to explore and, and learn more about. Um I'm I'm wondering in your experience if how you feel about both those models, if you think that um, one works better than the other or whether um, whether it's a combination of both uh, to meet it. You talked about meeting teachers where they're at. And I think that that's that's an interesting thing to try to think about what the practicality of that is. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that's really, it's tricky given, um, your resources in schools today to, to be able to meet teachers where they are at, because you have a range of abilities, right? You have those very beginning, and then you have those that are kind of advanced and want to take things and run with it. So as you were explaining those two different styles, I'm thinking in my head, well, they're both good, but a combination would really be great. So when you said combination, that made me feel like, okay, good. I don't have to pick one. (laughs) Um, But I, I think there's value in teachers understanding what the value is of something. Um, And so to have a presenter come in and to share things, I think is, is beneficial. Otherwise you might not get that buy-in, but then I think there needs to be that, that workshop style where you are exploring and troubleshooting and, you know, okay, here's my Google classroom enroll in it as a student. Let's work through what this actually looks like. Otherwise, I just feel like teachers hear about it, they get excited about it, and then they get back to the classroom and there's, you know, 2,000 other things that they need to be doing and it's tough for them to actually implement. So I would say a combination of those two. And I like what you talked about with at least, you know, the conference model is is a little bit different than the internal district PD because you have built-in sustainment with any sort of uh, – PD that you're offering to teachers within a district. But you mentioned that if you go to these conferences, you do a session and people are able to connect with you long term. And I do think that that's that's tremendously valuable to be able to down the road say, hey, I remember you did such and such at Boeing Conference. I'd like to uh, pick your brain a little bit about what I'm doing in the class. Here's what I'm doing. What do you think about this? Um, and, you know, I'm being being generic on purpose <laughs> with it. You would think that at a district level, that breadcrumb kind of like stretching out the conversation would be more prevalent. But in my experience, it's not necessarily the case. Uh, have you been... It, if, if you've been able to kind of stretch out the conversation over time with that, people coming in, not necessarily checking in with you or, you know, I don't know exactly what the experience is like there, I guess, is, is what, I'm, um, uh, what I'm realizing right now. But, <laughs> but, but it's like, like is, is communication pretty good? Like, is that informal learning where people come to each other uh, in a co-op or a collaborative way? about remember when we had this training uh, a little bit ago well I'm trying to do this what do you what do you think I should do here so you're talking about kind of like more locally within my district that's what yeah I'm okay yeah. well I think um one of the things that's really unique to Boynton City is that the more I you know meet people from other districts or travel around and kind of do PD for other districts um they're always amazed that we don't have a tech director so, right. um, we, we kind of like, you know, had to learn and learn quickly. And we've always had a tech coach. That was my role when I, um, one of my first years in Boyne city. And so that person has always kind of helped to keep facilitating the conversations. But I think one thing that that's really valuable for us is that we rely heavily on our own teachers to do our professional development days. and. I think that's powerful in two ways. One, it shows us, you know, that we're doing great things and our neighbors are doing great things. And sometimes it's hard to get teachers to actually sign up to present. You have to convince them like, no, that's really great what you're doing. You know, we're all like, oh, whatever. It's just something we do every day. It's not a big deal. Um, But it kind of builds the self-esteem of those teachers that, that are presenting. And then two, you're you're bringing in people who are practitioners and who we have relationships with so that when I am trying to do something um, with QR codes and the elementary Spanish teacher presented on QR codes at our last PD day, I can just shoot her an email and say, Hey, this isn't working for me. Can you help me out so that we can continue those conversations? So I think in that regard, it, it goes, it's going pretty well, but I think there's, there's always that struggle too with, you know, you sit down for your professional development time and you have to talk about this and you have to meet about that. Um, and so sometimes the housekeeping stuff, I guess, if you will, 
takes up a little bit more time than maybe you would want it to. Yeah. You know, I, I, I did a lousy job of asking the question, but I think that you kind of, you picked it up and ran with it. Um, it's interesting to me that no matter where you're at, the, the story's the same when you go into districts and it's like teachers, it's such, it's such a humbling profession in the first place because you've got to, you've got to learn to, um, accept having egg on your face on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> right? Like it's a, it's a fail, 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 success, fail, 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 uh, kind of environment because teaching people is, um, you know, it's, it's an arduous task and it's, um, but it's, it's such great work doing it. But I think that kind of a side effect is it is, is this, um, intense humility kind of prevents others from wanting to share the good that they're doing. And there's a difference between knowing that what you're doing is effective and knowing what you're doing could be shared to help others be effective. And I think a lot of teachers know that what they're doing at the classroom level, they know when something works and they know when something is really good. Um, I think that we're kind of lousy sharers and not because necessarily we're, we're hoarding resources because we don't want others to, to have them. I think it's, we, we, it's not necessarily innate for us to think, wow, uh, someone in a completely different subject area at a different grade level could pull this apart and take something from it. Like there's value for other educators and that I might not necessarily be able to see all the value in what I do for someone else, but that's not my job. My, my job is to share the good that, that I'm doing and, um, take advantage of platforms that allow me to introduce others to these things. And then it's the uh, participants, the people that are learning with us to continue on the, uh, the good work that we're doing, right? Like just because, I mean, you share, and a lot of times at these conferences, it's, it's complete consumption, especially in those, those sessions where people are dumping ideas on you. And it totally makes sense that that's the predominant kind of session because people are working in silos, do all this great stuff, and then they get the opportunity to share. And if they've, they're have they able to switch their brain on to think, I'm just going to share everything I'm doing and, and not worry about whether, whether people want to hear it or not, like – that's when the floodgates open up and, and just ev everything is, it comes out at once. Um, I really think that it's difficult to get to that point where you're like, this is not vain. This is, this is important for the profession that I do this. And if I put this out there, I have the opportunity to get a rebound effect from it where others are going to take it, do something great and help me to think about what I'm doing from a different perspective that could possibly make my practice better. Um, I, it's, it's difficult to get that, that first hurdle uh, accomplished where you feel comfortable opening up. Yeah. I like the phrase intense humility because I think that's, that's so true. And I think sometimes too, it even boils down to, you know, I have so many things going on day to day that it's, it's tough to share, but, um, you know, we have a teacher, one of our sixth grade language arts teachers is just very adamant about, we have to tell the story of what's really going on in our classrooms. <laughs> Otherwise people assume that it's, the same as when they were in school or that everything you hear in the media is, is what's really going on. And in fact, you know, there's really powerful learning going on and students are creating really, really cool projects. And, you know, as teachers, we have to share those things. Otherwise the news is going to be, or people's visions about what school looks like is just going to be dominated by standardized test scores or, you know, whatever else. I think a major part of that is that, yeah, we all have an understanding of what school is like, right? Like right. Uh, whether, whether you're in education or not. And even as an educator, I think that, that, uh, that paradigm of what school is, that factory based model is pretty well imprinted on our mind. 
one of the things that I know you're interested in is competency-based education. And when you were talking about like standardized scores and grades, um, I know in, in my experience, stakeholders that are outside of the four walls of your classroom, a lot of times we communicate through letter grades, like come in for teacher, parent teacher conferences. And well, Johnny's getting, getting a B minus and here are the three assignments that are to blame for that. And if they just get that rate, raise those letter grades, then uh, Johnny will be, you know, in a standing in no time. And I think a lot of times we have conversations with parents and, and students even where like feedback has become grades. Um, could you tell a little bit about um, how, how you got interested in competency-based learning, why it has value to you and how you're trying to fit that into your reality? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, it kind of all started, I guess, it, I think competency-based kind of starts with a shift to like standards-based grading. I think that's a, a first, a natural first step. And so my interest in that started actually not this past conference, but the one before at Boyne Tech, Dave Tebow talked about standards-based grading. And um, when you put on a conference, the bad part is you don't really get to sit in on many sessions. It's like, oh, I pop in for two minutes. And that one, I just said to Rebecca, I'm like, can you cover all the logistical things? Because I really want to sit in and hear about this. And I think I got to about 15 minutes of the, of the 50, but it was better than nothing. Yeah. And his point was, um, to one thing about extra credit, like, Oh, good job. You brought in Kleenex extra credit for you. <laughs> like, um, how, how does that work towards a kid's grade? First of all, that you brought tissues in. Um, and, and then also, you know, if a kid does fail a test or doesn't, clearly understand, you know, one of the content expectations or common core standards, then we just move on and we keep going. And I think it's, it's not always necessarily that they can't do it. It's just maybe there was a misunderstanding. Maybe there were, you know, a lot of things going on outside of school that week or that month where that was not their primary focus. Um, and so to just be like, oh, sorry, they don't get this one, I think is is kind of an oversight. And it's tricky too, because then, you know, how many times do you let a kid retake something when you get out into the real world? If I don't show up on time or have my work done, how long can I do that before I get fired? So there's, there's definitely kind of a, that delicate balance. But I think, you know, with the way that um, the world is going to start to move and jobs are going to start to move, it really will be more of like, hey, can you produce whatever you need to by this date. And if you can do it, great. And if that means that, you know, you're like a stay at home parent and you work when the kids are napping and at night, but you get your job done, then that's fine. Right. Um, and I, I think too, with technology, there's some more flexibility that can be granted to students. You just think about those students who, you know, maybe are high school students and then try to work 20 or 25 hours a week to help support their family. I really see it being a valuable piece piece for those students. But I think there's definitely that struggle too, where you said, um, you know, parents and students too, they're like, just, just tell me what my grade is. <laughs> and, uh, one, one teacher that I was sitting with actually at the My Blend conference, I was like, yeah, my, my college students even um, are like, can, can you give me more of, of what I need to do to show you that I know this? Like, give me more requirements in this project. So I think it's a huge shift. But, you know, to, to prove that you are, are competent in something could look different for a lot of different students. And, you know, depending on how they thrive and how they feel like they learn best, it gives them a lot of different options and opportunities to demonstrate that they do know rather than, a bubble test or uh, essay question where maybe that's not their strong suit. You bring up an important point about it being a culture shift, that it's not just throwing this um, 
designing this new feedback model and mastery, uh, you know, mastery based learning really is what it is. And figuring out all the things about how many times you let a, a student retake a, a quiz. If it's, you know, if, if a student's not getting a certain standard, if it's a, appropriate to keep hitting them with the same assessment over and over, um, formatively or, or summatively, you know, those are all important questions, but the culture thing is really the bedrock that needs to be laid in order for you really to start to change how feedback is given to students. And for the longest time, we've, I mean, the practicality of school is feedback to, to everyone is in letter grades, right? It's disconnected from the actual learning. And what I like about competency-based learning is it, it puts the learning into the conversation again. Um, it, it, it forces us to, um, well, not forces us, it rightly puts back the feedback process in learning because when when you require students to uh, go to 100% mastery on all of these standards, that means that we're going to be having conversations and you're going to get the TLC needed to get to that point. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've already started shifting in your own practice towards this or at least um, I, I'm wondering what steps – you would take whether you've done it already or whether you in you know, how you envision it happening like how would you how would you communicate this to administration that you're doing this to your parents about what to expect in conversations from from school and and then also I think the student level it makes a lot more sense because you see them on a day to day basis and you can communicate that this is a new way of of uh, doing things. But at the same time, you've usually competency based learning rubs the high achievers that have learned that do to school right yeah that, <laughs> that learn to play the game of school. Um, it kind of rubs them the wrong way because they don't understand the game anymore, right? So I'm. I'm the question here, and let me simplify it because I have a horrible <laughs> habit of just kind of lumping my thoughts and trying to make it a question. <laughs> if you've already done this, how have you gone about facilitating culture shift? And if you haven't done it already, how do you envision a teacher could go about executing a culture shift just for their learners and all the stakeholders in those learners' lives? Okay. Well, let me start first by saying that um, last year I started to read the book Drive by Daniel Pink. And uh, then this summer I kind of picked back up on it again and really started listening to that. And that really got me thinking about, you know, it, it, it's looking at what motivates people. Um, and when you think about his analogies for work, kind of like that carrot and stick and how that really doesn't work for that long. And then I start thinking about those in school. It's like, oh yeah, you know, eventually you lose any buy-in, you lose that sense of hard work because they're like, oh, I just want an A. So what do I have to do to get an A, right? And I think um, that that started to make me think about, okay, how am I doing things? So that was a good read first to mentally start that transition in my mind. Um, I think in my classroom already, I've started to give some more options about how you can display your knowledge, right? Okay. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in one format, but it um, allows for students to do things in different formats. And I think that's a first step. Um, I'm actually heading to our building school improvement meeting today because I think you could do standards-based grading in a standalone classroom, but I think there's going to be a lot of pushback unless it's like a grade level thing or a school-based thing. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I just think it's tough. Like, well, why do you do this one way when everybody else does it a different way? So I think that's kind of what's held me back from totally... Um, just implementing standards based, like, yep, you got it or you don't. Um, but hopefully I can kind of bring that up and talk about that today. 
Um, but you know, I, I think, like I said before, one of the first things is just kind of giving people or giving students options on, on how they show that they know something. A lot of times, you know, I think especially we do it with our special ed students. We allow them, we take the test and we say, okay, what do you think about this one? Cause I know this kid knows it, you know, and I've started to think like, why don't I do that with all of my students where they've demonstrated something so perfectly in class and I, I know that they know it. So why don't I go back to them and ask those questions after the test? And maybe it's, you know, a quick misunderstanding and, and we can, can figure that out from there. Um, I feel like I'm digressing on your question. No, right it, no, it, <laughs> adding, adding a little fuel to that fire. Um, I, 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 th- I think a lot of us recognize when when we get serious about standard based grading, um, uh, mastery grading, competency based grading, like they're all related uh, topics to me um, with uh, different people use different vernacular. Right. Um, But especially when you think of competency models like that whole that whole thing was designed to be a whole school thing, right? Like grade level progressions would no longer be tied to the calendar. It would be tied to student learning. Like competency based grading is a term that people use when they're talking about whole system education changes. But I think that it's, I think that it's dangerous to, um, I hate to get into a defeatist model or a defeatist mindset about the enormity, the scope of accomplishing something like that. Because obviously if I'm starting a new school today and I say, hey, we're going to do competency-based uh, learning with with this school, that's going to be what this entire new school district is, or just school in itself is going to be based off of. And I'm going to be hiring all new staff and they're going to be aware of that. And parents are going to be applying for this uh, for their students to go to the school or, or they're just going to be attending because they live there. It's that's a really clean way of jumpstarting a competency based learning model because you start from scratch. Right. And I, I think when you really get into it, you identify that it's difficult to transition, at least more difficult to transition a already established traditional school grading model um, to transition to a competency learning model. And I think that anyone who is thoughtful about this has the immediate reaction of, well, this can't just be at the classroom level. We've got to make sure that we have at least a grade level. We've got to have some uniformity um, because that makes sense. That's like ideal world, right? But like, if you, if you just think about mastery learning and you think about students and teachers and what teachers can control within their own uh, environment, you can take a lot of the tenets of of just teaching to mastery and just make sure that you're not making any artificial cutoff points that are within your control. Like uh, if we got common assessments across the grade level that we give at the end of each semester or each trimester, those are non-negotiable breakoff points uh, for student learning. If we talk about trimesters and and semesters and grade level, uh, you know, summer break and coming back and starting a new grade level, in our traditional models, those are cutoff points that are put in place. As a classroom teacher, you can't control that. Um, you can you can definitely start saying, "Hey, why does this have to be this way?" You can question it and you can openly offer alternatives, but one of the most effective ways to make change is to do the best you can within the confines of your classroom. Um, put this, put this open uh, a, a degree of student control over the pace of their learning, um, and put in your standard based model and have it tra- translate to to letter grades somehow. And say, look at this is what I'm doing within the current system. Imagine if we broke down these other walls that that I can't break down myself, right? Like I always think a live example, if I can say, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, and that's easier said than done, right? There's, there's <laughs> definitely some challenges with trying to work with, within the current system to challenge it, to possibly 
create um, more systemic change. But I, I just think that the, the way that education changes in places that are really established and traditional is at the classroom level with teachers doing innovative things and then being able to communicate and share how others could do it. Right. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> Yeah. It, and, was that a question? I don't think it was. No, no, that was <laughs> okay. a statement. That was, it, it, when my voice rises and I start talking faster, that's, <laughs> that's when I'm making a statement. But I think, I think um, you know, I'm in love with the concept of this. I'm working with a teacher right now that is trying to uh, – this mastery model is a component of his lesson structure. And – it's kind of like he he was he was thinking to himself, man, this is this is difficult. Like this mastery part takes up a lot of my time. I can use a lot of automated tools and, and everything like that. But at the end of a lesson, when students need to demonstrate their mastery, um, I'm the one that has to be the gatekeeper to let them on to the next thing or to provide them because um, you have to p- provide rich feedback. It can't mm-hmm. just be a. It can't just be a slap, slap a done uh, sticker on there and move on to the next thing. Like if we're looking at changing things um, for our students, we can say all we want about how we're not going to we're not going to you're not going to be assessed on letter grades alone. We're going to talk in terms of did you learn this or, or have you not learned this yet? And what can we do to help you learn this so that you can go on and learn something else? Um we it has have to, to be that growth mindset for kids right. too. Yeah. And not just the, I get it or I don't get it. Right. And and for that, like a teacher has to be fully invested in that part of um, the, the student learning process. To tell you the truth, I think the really difficult part about making this transition is a lot less about the fact that there's letter grades that are expected to be given at the end of a term or something like that. And it's a lot more about how I think, at least I was like this when when I was teaching, uh, especially early on, that all of my time is invested in the workup to, to student learning rather than the aftermath and the, um, the gap filling that happens in the feedback process. Um, I invested so much time in the design of lessons, especially since I was I was designing a blended format when there was I didn't have a lot of inspiration for I was I was doing blended because it felt right. Right. And I was spending gobs of time calling together resources and making it a coherent, synthesized experience for student learning. And. I. By the time I got to the classroom, my my facilitation of that lesson sucked because I really hadn't given myself time um, to plot out how I was going to be collecting. Uh, you know, I was collecting data, but like, how am I going to act on it? Um, right. um, when I get student responses, what's what's going to be my next thing? Well responding to 150 students uh, responses to a line of inquiry is it can seem taxing when you spent you sp- you stayed up till 1 a.m designing a sweet lesson for them to engage in right right when I get to that point a, a bit of fatigue sets in <laughs> and and I think and I, and I think my mindset wasn't as such where I recognized that, Hey, this feedback process is just as important, if not uh, more important than the design for learning in the first place. Because really, when you're talking about teaching a mastery, that's that's the glue that brings everything together is what you do in that feedback process. Right. Well, first, I have this. Have you seen the video? Mr. D uh, is grading tests. It's like this horrible example of. Um, how teachers grade tests is from the CBC. Have you seen that video? Um, I've heard of the show. Okay, I'm going to send you a link because it will crack you up. 
it's the perfect lead into this conversation <laughs> yeah. um, because he's like, oh, uh, you know, so this kid comes into the test. These are essays. I can't grade all of these. Okay. This would take me a lot of time. I would have to read. all. <laughs> it's horrible, but it's, it's kind of funny because you know, the reality is, yeah. If you think about reading 125 students responses and it gets tricky. One thing that's really, I guess also helped push me more into this, this idea that students have to control their learning is I did a reading apprenticeship last year and I, I'm in year two now, but the focus is really like as teachers, um, when we give them tough stuff to do, whether it's reading or whatever, um, a lot of times our students aren't getting out of it what we intend for them to. And so we just say, oh, I'm going to create a really cool PowerPoint or a really fun simulation so that then they don't have to do the reading or they don't have to do the tough stuff, but they'll still kind of get it um, and it'll be more fun and then we can move on more quickly, right? So I think that's kind of what you were talking about, like this idea that as teachers, we bear the burden of all this tough work because our students can't do things rather than going, this reading is tough. So let's start from day one and figure out how we can put supports in place whether it's, you know, reading strategies or talking about what roadblocks do you run into and how can you overcome them? Or even within your classroom, providing kind of that comfort zone of the think pair share, right? Where we're not asking you to read something and then respond on a test right away. So that got me thinking too. And so many, you know, I I did it again this summer and a lot of people, it was their first year and the first day you're like, Oh my gosh, this is so me. I'm so guilty of all this stuff. Yeah. But that's that's really what you're talking about too where you, you know, you find some great sources and you kind of structure the learning, but but then it's really the student's responsibility to learn and to do and to, you know, figure things out and then you're there to support and like you said, you do have more time to put into the feedback process and you're, you're in that process along the way too, because you're not up at the front leading everything and and not aware that some kids aren't, aren't following what you're talking about or aren't understanding. You make such a great point. And, and it makes me think about like, yeah, you can, you can accommodate, you can give yourself more facilitation time um, and, and do great differentiation by kind of simplifying your approach and like understanding that a great resource with with some great inquiry and some ambiguity for students to demonstrate learning can be a powerfully personalized experience for them rather than thinking I've I I think I think you're right like especially if you love lesson design and you have a firm grasp on how students think when you're putting something together, you you're you go deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole where you, you say, oh, I could put this in there because that would help, um, you know, this type of learner. And and I could do it for this and I can do it for that. And and a, a, a certain degree of like proactive differentiation is great, but a lot can be accomplished by just kind of putting it out there, really um focusing in on what's important with, um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking from like an, an ELA social studies standpoint where inquiry and a resource is, is a huge like learning opportunity for students. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to have some time to interact with this. And I'm going to be on the ground putting students together that are, that are going to work well together. Uh, and I'm going to facilitate myself and I'm going to bounce around. I'm going to spend so much time just getting into the minutia of each student's learning experience here. And if something comes up that I'm seeing like a common theme um, that students are struggling with, I'm going to put together a resource that, that covers that, or I'm going to stop everyone real quick and and say, Hey, I'm seeing this coming up. We're going to, um, we're going to focus on this for a little bit. And then I'm going to let you back on uh, to uh, working on solving this problem in, in the way that you're choosing to solve it. 
we spend so much time in like crafting tasks for students that we want them to do in such a certain way. And our rubrics become more of more shackles than they become guidance at that point. And it's all done with the best of intentions. It's just we go too deep into our own minds instead of thinking, how can I intentionally design this with openness, but provide enough guidance to where they get to the content area and start wrestling with those things themselves? Right, right. Absolutely. And I mean, that just kind of leads into that concept of, you know, project based or problem based learning too. like, um, and, and that I think can be so powerful too, when students are able to kind of take a little bit of a different view or lens on, especially for history. I mean, I teach, um, American history from the revolution to reconstruction. And some of my kids are like, Oh my God, who cares? This is so old. I always <laughs> wanted to teach eighth grade social studies. Yeah, I, 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 I did it in my student teaching and then thought, man, this is what, this is the content I'm going to get to teach for my entire career and then never taught it again. Yeah. So I'm jealous so, of you. Well, and yeah, I love it. And I taught high school U.S. history too. So that, you know, that's, I think that part is really fun and kids yeah. can see the civil rights connections and things like that. Um, but, but being able to then go like, well, how, how would you have gained independence or, you know, how would you have set up a new government? What kinds of things would you have done and giving them that freedom? But then, like you said, providing them just enough guidance so that they are getting into the resources that you want them to um, can be so much more powerful than like, okay, at the constitutional convention, they did this and they did that. And yeah. There's a great deal of thought that goes into asking the right questions, right? Yeah. Proposing the, the correct problem. Not not a correct problem. Let me a problem that's going to be thought provoking enough to where students are going to engage with it and hit the standards that that they need to hit. Right? There's a lot of cleverness that goes into that, but in a in a way, there's a lot less heavy lifting. There's a lot less time consuming lesson design in in that way. And my thought is that a teacher would be able to think a little bit more about planning for their students, like looking at what their students did the day before, um, you know, both from a, an observational in the face-to-face -face environment, seeing student struggles or students' triumphs, and then also anything that they're doing in an online space. Like if you've got students working in groups or, or individually in in uh, web-based documents where you can kind of be a snoop and, and see everything, um, you can, you can glean insights from that and you can make the decision, you know, when you're, when you're uh, after dinner and winding down for the day, like, what am I going to do tomorrow? Like such and such really needs me to, um, to step in here. And here are a couple of things that I'm going to uh, talk with them about, or I'm going to send them a quick, message right now while I'm thinking about it so that I don't have to do that tomorrow. This is something I can do in a message. And if I need to follow up, I will. But those are the kind of like a blended teacher with a problem-based design and a competency-based, mastery-based back end is really always constantly looking at student data and deciding when to intervene, when to let it breathe and let students sort things out for themselves and and really being that uh that maestro that's um that's directing rather than you know doing everything right and that's where you, that like like you said the technology piece of utilizing google docs for projects like this yeah i'm always i my kids are always i'm always invited into their google doc and sometimes like you said, once my girls are in bed at night, I hop on and I, I can look at things and make comments and give some directions that otherwise I might not be able to do if I was if I was teaching kind of in a different format. So yeah, that piece is cool. So what's um where where's your where's your brain at for this school year? Are you uh you ready to go? What's uh what's the big thing that that you're getting in place right now to get started? 
Um, well, <laughs> where's my brain at? It's all over the place all the time. <laughs> it should be. It should be. True story. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to look at how do we do things. And um, like I said, I've, I've been in reading apprenticeship. So that's kind of a big focus too, is um, really selecting text with intention and being deliberate about classroom time. And like I said, a lot of the, the a lot of kind of like the framework for reading apprenticeship, I think really lends itself nicely to, you know, anything with technology or just, just kind of standards based and competency based too, because you're doing things with intention. It's not like, Oh, uh, read this, read this section and you know, answer the questions at the end. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of the biggest thing is I'm just revisiting everything that I've done in the past and going, okay, is this intentional? Was I giving them enough guidelines, but also keeping it, you know, unrestrained so that they can take things in their own direction yeah. too. Um, and I'm like, last year I was on maternity leave almost at this point. So I'm looking <laughs> back and going, okay, what did I say to do? <laughs> no, so. I, I, I think it's, I think it's awesome that, I mean, everything that we just talked about, you're, you're thinking about how to, to implement it or improve upon already something that you're doing. That's really cool to hear. Um, and I love the way that you're combining all these different elements in a way that it doesn't, doesn't necessarily feel like, like they're, they're not disconnected concepts, right? The way that you're able to intertwine the, the, the problem-based approach, the, um, the standards-based grading idea and working incrementally to, to negotiate that into what you already do. That's really a great mindset to have. And I think, I think your head is rightly spinning on, on that, <laughs> on that, right? Like we never, we never turn that off. It's, it's never good enough. There's always tweaking that can be done because it's, you're, you're structuring the unstructurable, right? right. The, right. The, I mean, <laughs> learning, learning is, is so beautiful in its, um, in its diversity. Um, and really, if we can, if we can think about designing to accommodate all of these different, these, these different circumstances that come up, planning for the unplannable is, is a, is a really, really cool, really, really worthwhile venture, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I want to be sensitive to the time that we have together. Our recording just went over an hour. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> I love talking with you. I love, um, I hope I didn't talk too much, but, uh, I think that some of the things that you say just, uh, get me really geeked and I start, <laughs> I start just dumping my brain. So I hope that you felt like, uh, uh like this conversation was as, uh, beneficial for you as it was for me. So I appreciate that. No, absolutely. I, I love talking about this stuff and it, it's nice to know that there are other people <laughs> who, you know, are on the, on the same page and I'm not doing stuff that's, that's too out there and crazy. But well, we are doing like out you there said, crazy you know, stuff, your brain's but yeah. right. But I think, you know, if you said your brain is always spinning and I, I think if there's ever a point where it's not, then I'm like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I assume that, so my brain goes all sorts of different directions. And I think that that's part of just the creative mindset. Right. Um, and I think it's good, especially when you're teaching or you're working with teachers to be nimble and be adaptive and have all of these great thoughts and then, um, throw them out the window when something, <laughs> something doesn't work with it. Right. Um, Right. And I really value the colleagues that I have around uh, me that I can collaborate with that have a more structured and <laughs> streamlined approach to thinking <laughs> because it helps me to get to the right place. So I think that that's where I value collaboration the most, where I think I just spitball ideas and then other people can tell me whether whether they have substance or not, or right. help me to at least communicate them in a mo co more coherent way. Cause I still think I have, I have teacher brain where I, it makes sense to me and that's all that matters. But like when you're helping others, you've got to be able to be coherent with it. Right. You've got to be able to, to speak others vernacular with things. Um, right. But anyway, um, uh, best of, best of luck in the first couple of weeks of school here. Um, whipping Thanks. everybody into shape. 
And um, that's right. I will I will see you online and and uh, we'll chat soon for sure. All right. Sounds awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. See ya. Thanks for listening to My Blend Stories. For more, visit myblend.org.